the gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. His book is called Taking London, and it releases today in the United States. And New York Times bestselling author Martin Dugard joins us now. Marty, welcome back to the show. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Always loved the show. Thank you very much. And uh, I've been looking forward to this book since we talked about taking Paris. Uh, I was looking forward to this book, and I was happy to see it out. Um, and uh, Churchill is a larger-than-life figure. Um, still, you know, people are still interested in him today. And in your research, did you find it out anything that surprised you or felt it was new to you? I think it goes back to the most of the very start of the book, you know, it was before Hitler was, um, I mean, be, before the war actually began, it was it was when Churchill was um, not yet really in the government. He wasn't even back in the Admiralty yet. And he lived around the corner from um, uh, the Parliament buildings at a place called Morpeth Mansions. And he had a top floor apartment with uh, Clementine and they, uh, it was very small. It was it was like a ship's galley almost, you know, so much so that when he wanted to write, he had to write standing up. Um, but when the, on the very first day of the war, September 1st, 1939, um, when the air raid siren sounded for the first time, he, instead of going down to the, uh, the, the air raid, the bunker, he went up onto the roof with a bottle of, uh, with a bottle of brandy just to watch the action. Um, but I like that little insight before, because everybody knows that the Churchill from May 10th, 1940, when it becomes prime minister and becomes this big inspirational character. I liked getting to know the Churchill before that, who mm -hmm. had been this voice crying in the wilderness throughout the thirties, you know, telling people the war was coming, that we needed to arm, that it was, it was happening. And Britain was so peace loving at the, at the time they wanted to think that uh, the war to end all wars had already taken place. And he was saying, no, there's more coming. We need to watch out. Yeah. And yeah. So and he, he had a, he was fanatical in his, distaste for hitler even before hitler came uh, it became you know the hitler that we know of as the warmonger yeah he had a feeling what hitler was all about that's for sure the, yeah he he cultivated a churchill cultivated a uh, network of informants to tell him about uh nazi troop buildups because remember at the time they weren't supposed to arm themselves they weren't supposed to have an air force their navy was supposed to be almost non-existent and then you know, he was getting reports out of Germany, like, hey, things are happening. We need to be ready. And when he would go on the on the radio, on the BBC and tell people about it, nobody wanted to listen. They thought he was just a, he was a crank. That's why they were able to build up such a glider force, the German glider force. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> because it I, was love, I love that. Yeah. And, you know, and Lufthansa, the, all these airline pilots all of a sudden became the uh, fighter pilots, you know, the minute that they, they announced that they had their own air force. Yeah. So it, it was pretty clever. It was, it was. Well, these are, you know, dark days in the early part of the war in 1940 for Britain, that's for sure. But Churchill had a, a visionary partner who uh, became air marshal, Hugh Dowding. Um, tell us a little bit about him. He was a, he was an interesting guy. I mean, he was, he was a believer in air power from the start. I mean, he didn't actually, you know, he was a, a long time member of the service. He switched over into the, in, into the flight aspect of the during World War One. Um, but he, you know, he was in charge of fighter command. And even before the war came, he knew that uh, Great Britain didn't have enough Spitfires, didn't have enough hurricanes. And he was the one who basically realized that by the middle of the 1930s that, you know, Britain's fighter planes were no match for the Nazis, you know, and they were just developing better stuff. Um, but also he was instrumental in getting um, IDF towers, which, you know, which we know today as radar up, up and down the coast. And he planned the whole strategy for, for making sure that if it did come down to, you know, the Nazis trying to invade Great Britain, 
that he had a strategy of, of, for aerial, aerial combat to save the nation. And at the time, you know, the fighter plane was not the glorious plane that we think of now. Like when, I, when people ask what the book is about, I'll say it's kind of like Top Gun meets the Nazis because you have these brave fighter pilots, you know, these, these, these Nazi pilots. But at the time, Bomber Command was much more uh, empowered had been much more going on than, than the fighters and the fighters were, were were not seen as these romantic heroes that they became during the Battle of Britain and uh, let's talk more a little, little bit more about the pilots they were called the few uh, they earned that nickname yeah. in my research about the book um, I found out that one of the few is still living I got down to one person and that's uh, John Hemingway an Irish RAF officer. I'm not sure if he's still still with us, but he is. He is great, great. And uh, that was my question: if you had actually had an opportunity to speak with him or the families in your research. No, you know, it was. Um, and this sounds terrible, but I'm glad he's in there. Uh, he he was instrumental. There, he, there's a couple. If you go online and poke around. He wrote some very eloquent things about what it was like to be stationed in France, and you know, just at the start of the war and how beautiful it was, and and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was looking the when the book was originally finished, it was just it was lacking a few things. It just needed uh, just a couple scenes to punch it up and you know bring the action home a little bit more. And I read some of his comments about being in France not knowing he was the last living RAF pilot. And so um, I, I researched him, I put it in the book and I talked about where they were stationed and what they were doing. And then I just kind of started poking around and learning more about him. I learned, like you said, he's 104, he's st still alive. And um, I should actually try to get him a copy of the book because I mean, he's it, he's the last pilot. And amazing. And you know, th this was all happening 84 years ago. So that tells you that you know, it's, it, it was, I wish I'd written it 10 years ago. Let's put it that way. Then I could have really talked to some of these guys. That would yeah. have been cool. Yeah. Yeah. Those opportunities to interview World War II soldiers and pilots are, have almost slipped away. Yeah. yeah. One of the uh, characters in the book that you highlight is uh, an American pilot and American pilots did join this effort. Uh, Billy Fisk. And he was, uh, from what I read, an Olympic bobsledder. Tell us a little bit about him. Uh, Billy Fisk was a dude. Uh, he was really, you know, he was um, he, he was an Olympic gold medalist. He he carried mm -hmm. the flag at, at the 1932 Olympics. Um, so you know he he was in the Olympics twice. He was he was known for for just being this adventurous swagging dairy do. He founded the ski resort in Aspen, Colorado, that still exists to this day. And he was the guy who had the forethought to say, we need a ski resort here. Um, but he was also, he was also educated. He came from money. He was from Chicago. And so and he was educated in England. Um, the company he worked for brought him home when, uh, when the war broke out, but he wanted to, he wanted to go back. And so he literally sailed on one of the last ships to, to leave New York for England just before September 1st, 1939. Um, but at the time, you know, Americans weren't allowed to fight on the side of the Britons, so he had to pretend to be Canadian. But, and I, I think that that story is a little bit implausible, and it's simply because he, the the circles he traveled in, especially in in Europe, like in Saint Moritz and in some of those really swanky ski places, a lot of those people uh, were in fighter command, and they were in they were pilots. In other words, he was used. He had the connections, but he had to kind of make it sound like he was a Canadian. But I think the deal was done long before he got on the ship. But fascinating guy, married um, married a very wealthy, titled British woman. Um, uh, be, you know, became a he already had a little bit of flying stuff, but you know, be, literally became a hurricane pilot within just months. And mm -hmm. um, fascinating, you know, really. Uh, a really, really great character to stumble on to put into a book. Yeah, with all that background, uh, very unique. Um, now, these American pilots, and there was more than one, it was more than Fisk. Um, yeah. When they came back to the States and America entered the war, were they able to hit the ground running or did this experience with Britain um, help in the war? 
I don't, you know, the, the American pilots that were part of the Battle of Britain, most of them, when America came into the war, just moved laterally into uh, the Army Air Force. I think it was, was it the Army Air Force? The Army, Army Air Corps. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, in the early days, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and then, and I was actually looking to these guys to see if there was a, a book in them, and, and there were more than you'd think, but almost all those guys, I mean, they, they fought well into the war. Almost all of them died. It's it was just it's really tragic. But mm -hmm. that was that was aerial combat. You just never knew if you were going to come back or not. And there's there's a line in the book about sometimes a squadron would get new pilots, and they'd show up in the morning, they'd immediately get into a plane and they'd and they'd fly and they'd get shot down and they'd die before anybody in the squadron got to know them or before they even had breakfast. It was just one of those. It just happened. You know, just very tragic. The fighter pilots or the bomber pilots? Because I know the bomber pilots were also, uh, and the mortality was high with the bomber pilots. Yeah. No, well, I, I kind of focus mostly on the fighter pilots. So that's the, that quote, that quote somewhere in the book about that. But um, yeah, the bomber pilots, I don't, I don't know if you've been to those, any of the, in some of the British aerial museums, you can kind of look into like a cross section of what a bomber was like. And we think of the, they're these heavy, heavy, steel beasts you know and they're they look, look like they're held together with chicken wire and spit you know it's yeah very very i can't even imagine how they didn't pressurize them so they didn't have to be that thick but very flimsy were you able when you went over to london because i know that you were in london doing some research on this were you able to go to the um, i believe there's an uh, an air museum there, were you able to sit in one of the British aircrafts, Spitfires or anything like that? Uh, I went to all the museums and I, I'm a big, I grew up in Air Force bases. And, and when you grow up in air, on an Air Force base, if you're, a, 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 you know, a budding history nerd, uh, what you do is you go to the base of static display of all the, the old bombers. And so I used to literally crawl inside B-17s and see, see, you know, 129s or, but anyway, uh, when I was doing this book, I went to the RAF Museum, I went to Imperial War Museum, Duxford, I went to a number of museums. And uh, when I was doing the initial research, I thought, and I noticed that one of the museums had a, a, a Spitfire simulator. And I thought, well, I got to do that. That'd be fun. And then I dug a little more. And I found there's a place just outside, outside London at one of the old RAF airfields where you can actually fly in a Spitfire. So wow. I signed up. Uh, went out there, they, they put you, it's, you don't just get in the plane. It's not a commercial experience. You put on a flight suit, you go through, the, you put on a parachute, you go through a whole evacuation procedure. You know, I can still tell you how to get out of a Spitfire if, if I had to. Um, <laughs> but they had some two-seater Spitfires they had built later in the war as training planes. So I got to sit in one of those and we did the the dives and the, you know, in the, in the victory rolls and it was super super cool and for just a little bit the guy the, the pilot said um you can take the controls and i'm like oh man this is great so Whoa. i get to fly like five seconds and he took them right back because i would have crashed it but yeah <laughs> it was it, it was i've got a video of it and it's and every now and then when, I, when i'm feeling bored i just i look at it and it's like i can't believe i got to do that it was so cool oh one of the fringe benefits that's for sure yeah, that writing this awesome. book yeah the book is called Taking London, and it releases today. Marty, thanks for coming back on the show. Rob, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, thanks. I hope to be back for my next one. That's it for this episode. Be sure to check out some of our other videos. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.